that's him smiling. I know it's a small picture, and I probably should have put it up there for you, but uh, that's him smiling, Chris Mintz, after uh, seven shots that he was wounded by. Um, in fact, he said he was really trying to protect other people, and he was not going to let more people be hurt by the shooter in Oregon. He, as, long, as well as eight others, were wounded. Ten people were killed. One who was the shooter was one of those ten who took his own life. What's the story? As I mentioned earlier, I, I remember when it was first uh, occurring, I heard them actually saying people were being questioned about their religion. As we've learned more details about that, it appears that what was actually stated was Stand up if you're a Christian. Stand up if you're a Christian. And with that, the shooter would go at one person, and the shooter said, that's good because in a second, you're going to meet your maker. And he killed them. Now, we don't know what all happened and how many people stood up, and, and really that doesn't matter. You can be seated. But, but what matters is that it may cost you something to stand up for Jesus. And in fact, it should. And that maybe we've been a little too complacent with our faith. And some of that's because we've enjoyed such freedom in this country, such privilege, really, that, that we can do and think and believe as we choose to and argue about that, and, and it really is kind of okay. But there is a growing hostility towards Christianity in this country. And there's a variety of reasons for that, aren't there? Some of that hostility um, may be, be simply because of the cross, the cross is offensive, ladies and gentlemen. The fact that that one man would come and die on that bloody stained cross and say that the only way for you to get into heaven is to accept the payment he paid on that cross. That offends people. <laughs> it should offend people that without Christ there is no way to God. There's no being good enough. There's no being religious enough. There's no special acts that you can do that are somehow going to get you in. You can't make it. But the cross offends people. The tough thing also is, is that some of the teachings of Christ are offensive too as well, aren't they? A certain young man had all kinds of wealth and Jesus told him, you know what? If you really want to inherit eternal life, I mean, you really want it just to, to, to be given to you, then, then here, you have one thing in your way, and it's your wealth. Go sell everything you have, give it to the poor, and then come and do the one thing you need to do to inherit eternal life. Come, follow me. And that's what Jesus said. Get rid of everything that's in the way, everything that's hindering you, everything that's an obstacle, everything that's most important to you because you're focused on that. And instead, you want to inherit? Come follow me. Come be my brother and you'll inherit from me eternal life. I've um, had a few years ago when um, some of you remember Proposition 8? Proposition 8 was a proposition in this state to say that marriage, a very simple straight proposition, that marriage is between a man and a woman, period. It was the proposition. It actually passed. Now, as some of you might know, the court and, and our state attorney general and our governor did not support that, uh, that proposition. And now today, uh, we have further things that have happened, and we have a Supreme Court ruling that has said, no, marriage is different than we've defined it, and especially, and you need to note this, different than the Bible defines it. It was during that time that somebody wrote me an anonymous note. My friends in the ministry say, don't read anonymous notes. <laughs> If you ever get in the ministry, 
you might want to take them up on their advice. <laughs> um, but I got this anonymous note, and, and the note said, Pastor Bill, why do you have to be talking about marriage and homosexuality? Don't you know that you have several people in your congregation that are practicing homosexuals, and you shouldn't be saying any, anything about it? I had a gentleman come to my office this week, deeply broken, wounded. Uh, he was crying. I mean, just crying. And he was broken because the relationship that he's been in with another man for six years came to an end. And I wonder what my job should be at that moment. Tell him about his sin? Or just show him love. I have a very solid, well-founded, biblical view of marriage. And I, and I recognize and believe that a lot of what our society says is okay, in God's eyes, is not. It's a sin. And folks, let's go, you know, think about that. Is divorce, in God's eyes, a sin? It's a sin. Now, does God forgive sin? Okay, we should, probably should say that before I go too far, before I lose you all, right? Does God forgive sin? Yes. Okay, yes. God forgives sin, and that's the good news when you talk about sin, is that God forgives it. However, should we sin just so that we get more forgiveness? Well, Paul said it this way. Should we sin just so that more grace would abound? And what's his answer? No way. Uh -uh. No, we don't sin just to get forgiven. Uh, some of us have done that, though. Yes? Yes. Y yeah. Well, uh, I'll get forgiveness later, so I'm going to go ahead and do this, whatever it might be. And, or at least if I don't get caught, I'm okay, right? I, I won't ask how many of you have ever messed up on your taxes on purpose. Or, or ever driven faster than the speed limit, or whatever else you might say, because sin is a sin is a sin is a sin. Amen? Okay. But here's the challenge, is that some of our sins affect others more so, don't they? And, 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 and one of those things is that relationships and marriage is one of those things that, that can affect others. If I get a divorce, my sons are going to be wounded by that, aren't they? My wife is going to be wounded by that. Her parents are going to be wounded by that. I'm going to be wounded by that. I mean, so many of us think that, you know, well, we'll just get a divorce and it's all taken care of, right? I mean, so, some of you who have been divorced, you can tell the rest of the people here that divorce doesn't make everything happy and peachy and keen, does it? No, it, it, it can, hurt can continue and will continue. And there's all kinds of stuff. And here's the thing is that there's, there's sin, right? Well, how about this one, adultery then? Is that sin? Um, how about this one, the use of pornography? No, isn't pornography just about me and my private place? I'm in my secret place because obviously I'm not going to use porn with other people around. So isn't, isn't porn a sin? Yeah, and doesn't, doesn't porn actually... Oh, oh, oh no, oh no. Jesus said, if you thought it, you've done it. If I'm using porn, aren't I thinking about adultery? So I've done it. Oh. We're kind of in trouble, aren't we? So maybe as a church, we should just not talk about sin anymore. I mean, it, you know, it's so painful. It messes people up. gets people feeling guilty, judgmental, critical, and all those other kinds of things. Maybe we should just not talk about sin anymore, right? I don't think so. Because if we don't talk about sin, then we're like the parent who has the child messing around in the supermarket and everyone else is saying, please control that child. And the parents are like, you're oblivious to it. And if that behavior goes on, that child is going to grow up irresponsible, undisciplined, and get in trouble in other settings. And who messed up the most? Well, it wasn't the parent's fault because it was a rebellious two-year-old. And so how can you blame mom and dad, right? No, no. They're both responsible, aren't they? The parent and the child. And here's what Hebrews says, is that the father disciplines those he loves. Hey, Dad, have you ever disciplined? 
If you love them, you'll discipline them. Right, Mom? If you love them, you'll discipline them. Now, now, I didn't say you go out there and you make them all bloody, okay, did I? I didn't say you have to do it in a cruel kind of way, but if you love them, you'll discipline them. Because God loves us, he will point out our sin. So this morning we are beginning a series on marriage. You have a statement of marriage in your worship bulletin today. We are going to ask that the members of the church vote on that statement in, I believe it will end up being in November. And we're going to go through that statement for the next five weeks and try to take its various pieces. The first part is that we are going to look at today is we believe that God wonderfully and immutably creates each person as male or female. These two distinct complementary genders together reflect the image and nature of God. Rejection of one's biological gender is a rejection of the image of God within that person. And when that gentleman came and sat in my office in tears, now some people would have said, well, why'd you even have him in your office? Because this was a man who was hurting and needed to be shown compassion. Now here's somebody might say, you know, whoa, Bill, you really messed up this time. Because when I was sitting there with him, guess what I talked to him about? Going back and talking to the man. I talked to him about relationship. I should also say that when he walked up and he shook the door out there and I opened it up, he says, I'm a liberal, you're a conservative, we're very different. And then he started crying. He knew exactly what I believed, had no question about that. And yet, isn't it interesting that where did he come for compassion? A place where he knew I was in total disagreement with his behavior. I had a totally different theology about that. But he hoped he would find what? Love, 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 love. I, I, I say, make, need to make this one comment, and thank you, Doug. Um, I do not share this for in, with any sense of pride for myself or, at all. I, I, I share this because I think God timed this moment even to help me as I try to go through this series to be compassionate. For us to try to not just say, here's our position, but to show love as we do that. And that doesn't mean that somebody won't stand in front of us with a gun and fire that gun because they don't like the fact that you're a Christian. That still may happen. And people still may get upset because Christ and the cross are offensive and Christ warns us about that fact. So the verse that uh, I want us to look at this morning is Genesis 1. I think we need to go back to the, to the beginning literally and say, okay, so why and how and what was the purpose of our creation? And Genesis 1 verse 26 says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. And God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over every living creature that moves on the ground. God, help us to apply and understand this word, especially its creative pieces, its, its unique words there, being made in your image, in our image. God, help us to understand all that. You speak to us. You teach to us right now, I pray in Christ's name. Amen. 
It's, it's a, such an amazing thing. It's a, and, and, I, and I don't think I can get it out to you strong enough. But you and I have been created in the image of God, the imago dei. We are actually made to be a reflection of God. In fact, New Testament talks about us reflecting Jesus Christ, and we reflect Jesus Christ to the world. I, I wish I had a mirror for everybody today, and I'd give it out to you and say, look in the mirror and see, am I reflecting Jesus? And so you go home. Do, do, do all of you have mirrors at home? Good. Go home and look in that mirror and say, am I you? Not, not me. Okay. Are you reflecting Jesus? I want you to look in that. Because here's the thing. You were made in the image that God imagined for you. God had this image of how he wanted to create you, and he shaped you that way. He's given you personality. He's given you special features. He's given you strengths. He's given you some weaknesses, hasn't he? But you've been created in the exact image of God. More than that, as the creation of the image of God, you reflect God. Not only are you the way he imagined, and remember, he created you in your mother's womb. For Psalm 139 said, I think we read it earlier, for you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. Did God know you before you were born? That's what the psalmist is saying. God knew you in your mother's womb. God knit you together in there. And, and, and you know, you're going to say, I'm harping on this, but it's just one of the reasons why I say abortion is not right. Okay? It's just not. But he, says, he goes on, he says, I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Really? How many of you have ever looked in the mirror and said, oh, God, you blew it? Well, maybe you didn't say it that way. You looked in the mirror and you said, oh, you're ugly. Oh, look at that eyebrow, that nose, that chin, whatever it is, right? There's some part of you that haven't you ever looked at? If you have, I, this, this is confession day, okay? If you've ever looked in the mirror and thought there's something about you that's maybe not what you like, and you, would you just raise your hand? You've ever looked in the mirror? Okay, just look around, folks. Oh, hands back up. Just look around. Most of us think that there's something imperfect about us. Now, that may have gotten different as we got older, right? I mean, I still... <laughs> I still am Chilly Willy, okay? Chilly Willy is this big, fat, chunky kid, okay? Overweight... I know I'm a little overweight already, so never mind. Let's go on. <laughs> we have this view of ourselves, and we see these little idiosyncrasies and all, but the thing is, God made you exactly with the way he wanted you to be. You are special to him. To be made in the image of God is to be created just the way he wanted you. He loves you the way you are. He thinks highly of you the way you are. And not only that, but he created you also to be in community. Did you catch the interesting phrase in verse 26? It says, Then God said, Let us... What? Who be the us? Make man in our image. What? Now, come on, don't we believe in one God? Only one, right? This is some, uh, some of the criticism that sometimes Judaism has towards Christianity because cr Judaism says, no, you all believe in three gods. And see, we only believe in one God. But, but, but wait a second, what's he actually saying here? Let us make man in our... Uh, incidentally, Judaism, do you know what they say about that verse there? Well, the G God is talking about him and the angels, uh, now, if you can find anywhere in any place in Scripture where it says that God talked with the angels about what he was going to do for creation, I'd be amazed because you won't find it. All right. So what's happening? Incidentally, if you backed up in Genesis 1, you'd see that it talks about that, that God spoke and things were created. Right? God speaks and things come into existence. In fact, not only that, but he talks about and the spirit, the ruach, the wind of God, the spirit of God was doing what? Hovering over the waters. 
In fact, at the very creation of mankind, what does God do? Genesis 2 is going to give us more of a picture of this too, right? In fact, some people say, oh, Genesis 1, it's a contradiction to Genesis 2. No, it's just a different way of looking at the same experience. Genesis 1, he's laid it all out, this order to creation. And now in Genesis 2, he's going to come back and he's going to speak specifically about mankind. And he says what? God shapes man out of the dirt of the ground. And then what does he do? He breathes into him the breath of life. And he speaks and he calls him Ish. And he says, this is very good. To be made in the image of God is to be very good. And too many of us jump to Genesis 3 because we got to quickly move to the fact that, yeah, but everything's bad because we've all sinned and fallen short. Amen, that's true. But sometimes we need to stop and just bask in the fact that we have been created in the image of God and he saw us as very good. And notice, he spoke. Oh, doesn't that sound like something else we've read? In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was God and the Word was with us. And the Word did what? became flesh and dwelt among us full of grace and truth. And if you continue, it also talks about the anointing power of the Spirit of God. Or how about at the baptism of Jesus Christ, what takes place there? The Son is submitting himself and obeying the Father, and he goes into the water, and the Father speaks from heaven, and it can actually be heard. And he says, this is my beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased. And what also happens? And the Spirit of God descends like a dove upon Jesus. And what do you have, folks? The Trinity present again, don't we? Now... Be aware of this, okay? Let's not overstretch Genesis 1. Genesis 1 is not trying to really be a a lesson on the Trinity, but the Trinity's there. I mean, you can't get away from it. God the Father, God the Spirit, God the Son, the spoken word, they're all present in creation. And God has made us a reflection of him. Now, I said something earlier, you've got to come back to it. A part of that being a reflection of God is is that we are to be like God, community. And what God goes on to say is, is the best community is this one. A husband, a wife with God. That's the best community. And isn't the other one just like it? God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. A community. And we are called to be a community like that. We're not called to be like many of us as Americans, to be isolated, being private, not letting anyone else know what's going on in our life. We're called to be a part of community, just like the God is. He is community, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And he says, we're called to be helpmates. And as helpmates, we're to complement each other. Bob Defabal said, a sexual side of this relationship was part of the paradise experience. Sex did not originate with or after the fall. Did you know that? Sex was before the fall. Procreation and physical intimacy were intended from the beginning. Read Matthew 19. This is something that God set up from the start. We were supposed to be Husband, wife, couple, family, and and sex took part as a part of that. What was argued in front of the Supreme Court? One of the key arguments that went before the Supreme Court, that that obviously they took other arguments instead, one of the key arguments is, is that you cannot procreate without husband and wife. You can't do it. Yes, you could artificially inseminate wrong word, (laughs) inseminate a a person using someone else's, and so therefore two women could somehow parent, but they can't can't procreate. You can't do it without the man. You can't do it without the woman. You have to have both coming together, and that's the way God created it. And they said, because of that, this is why marriage is set up as husband and wife. I understand. I had the gentleman recently at another meeting who was a young man, like probably a 26, something like that, married to a man of 50. 
And he talked about the fact he had the big diamond on his finger. He talked about the fact that he was a housewife and that they together were raising the children. This man had, had children, so he was helping raise the, quote, stepchildren in that case. We are to be a reflection of God. And that involves male and female reflecting together the unity of God, helpmates one to another, complementing each other. He said we're made in our image. Verse 14 of John says, The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us, and we have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified concerning him. He cried out saying, this is the one I spoke about when I said, he who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. Out of his fullness we have all received grace in place of grace already given. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God but the one and only Son who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the Father has made him know, known. We are in relationship. That's what God's saying. He says, made in the image of God. Matthew 3 says, as soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water, and at that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove, alighting on him, and a voice from heaven saying, this is my son whom I love, and I am well pleased. You see, it's as two distinct genders, man and woman, husband and wife, male and female, that we complement each other and together reflect the image and nature of God. Debbie and I are different. Now, yeah, we have some similarities. We've learned to make some agreement with one another, right? We've become much more united. But I'm sorry, folks. We're still a lot different. <laughs> but we are uniquely designed to be different. Everybody look at your right and your left hand. Hold them out in front of you. All right, look at your own right and left hand because I don't want you to get it mixed up. So don't look at your neighbors, okay? Your own right and the left hand, have you not ever noticed they are exact opposites? They are exact opposites. Turn them over. I mean, totally, completely opposite. Just like husbands and wives are. It's one of the things that both can sometimes be the bane of marriage. It's also the blessing of marriage. I am so thankful I didn't marry somebody that looks like me. Okay? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> God created us and uniquely fashioned us. And I don't need to go into any more detail than that, but you understand it. God fashioned us to go together, husband and wife, like right hand and left hand. Total opposites, yet when united together, become so much stronger than when separated, okay? And God set up and created male and female to uniquely come together as one like that. And that is being created in the image of God, the, the imago dei. The Imago Dei provided the foundation for the Hebrew concept of human personhood. And certain practices common among other ancient Near Eastern societies were forbidden by the Torah because they were united. So they did not do child sacrifice. They did not expose infants. They didn't do infant infanticide. They didn't even do castration because they believed in the Imago Dei and people being created in that. Who's man? Who is man? Lord, our Lord, Psalm 8, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. Through the praise of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and stars which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them? Human beings that you care for them. I mean, how many of us are as tall as Mount Everest? <laughs> as great as Niagara Falls, <laughs> have the energy of lightning or can quiet a storm. We're nothing compared to creation. And yet, Psalm 8, 5, you have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet, all flocks and herds and the animals of the wild, the birds in the sky and the fish in the sea, all that swim the paths of the sea. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. What did verse 28 say? 
God blessed them and said to them, to who? Husband and wife. The pair, the team that is like the team in heaven. God bless them. He said, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. And God said it was very good. Years ago, we did a series called the Bethel Series. And the Bethel Series was 40 lessons on the New Testament and the Old Testament. And the first three lessons were all about how God created everything good. And the picture was beautiful. It was a beautiful picture that kind of did the scene of everything was good. Good with God, good with one another, good with ourselves, and good with creation. And there was harmony. And they actually, this man, Carly Swigum, had this picture and he put these notes. And there was harmony in heaven and on earth and among people and among creation. And the next picture, and it's kind of the one we all start to rush to. The next picture, the harmony is broken. The colors are all lost. Everything's kind of black and gray. And there's brokenness in relationship with God and brokenness in relationship with one another and brokenness inside ourselves and brokenness with creation. And what happened? We sinned. And with that, a distorted image has come. The last part of our first paragraph said a rejection of one's biological gender is a rejection of the image of God within that person. And some of us, when we get too discouraged, when we get too self-focused, are distorting and rejecting the image that God has placed within us. Second Corinthians says it this way. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. The goal of a Christian is to what? Reflect God, the image of God in our lives. And the problem is we've gotten distorted, and we've gotten distorted by our attitudes, by our sin, by the choices we've made. God created people to reflect his image instead and to rule over creation and to reproduce godly offspring. And instead, we sin. And what do we need? A new picture. A new image. Ephesians 4 says, You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. We're created, folks, to again put on the image of Jesus Christ. And we need to get rid of old nature and take on the new. Colossians says it this way, chapter 3, 9. Do not lie to each other since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Colossians goes on, in fact, in the first chapter, says, the Son, did you catch this one? Colossians 1, verse 15. The Son is the image of the visible, invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. When we look at Jesus, what do we see? God, the Creator. We get to actually view God. That's why Christ came in the flesh. So we'd be able to see and experience the presence of God in our lives. And then what did the God the Son do once he went to heaven? Left the Holy Spirit to dwell in all of us, anyone who would believe. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold to together. <clears throat> and I, I'm sorry, I forgot to write down who this is from, so here's a quote. <laughs> this is your takeaway value. In verse 16, it says that all things have been created by him and for him. You were created for God. You. 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 I should be calling out everyone's name, shouldn't I? <laughs> you were created for God. And if you were created by God and for God, do you have worth? 
I, somebody would be screaming, hollering, amen, yes, yes, yes. Uh, are you of value to God? Yes. Or otherwise, he wouldn't have created you. Would he create anything for himself that does not have value? That does not have worth? No, he wouldn't do that. So you, 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 everyone here today were created for him. And that included the gentleman who came crying at my office. Was he not <laughs> created for God? Folks, we need to surrender to Christ. The world is right. Christians have pointed out some sins and ignored others. If you're married, are you honoring Christ in your marriage? Are you each showing the respect that the other one should have because Christ dwells in them? Are you given in to temper, to conflict, to frustration and problems because you're not showing the love and respect that, that you should be given that other person? Folks who are married, don't we have a responsibility to reflect Christ to our community? Have you ever not noticed that marriages are under attack, and I'm not talking about our culture? Marriages are under attack because they are the unit that most reflects God. Husband and wife with God, unity, right? Evil wants you all to be in battle with that spouse, to not honor God in your relationships because by doing that, then you won't reflect God to our world. Isn't it interesting that Jesus himself said, where two or more of you are gathered together in my name, there I am, I'm in the midst of that unity, and whatever they ask, I'll do it if they agree. And what people have the potential for agreeing the most? Or also disagreeing the most. <laughs> Husband and wife. And as a church, we are going to stand for marriage as God created it. Husband and wife. Are you willing to surrender to Christ? and his image for you? If you're married, are you willing to surrender your marriage to him? If you're not married, are you willing to surrender every part of who you are to him? Because that's what the communion table's about. He surrendered himself to a cross in order that if we will surrender to him, we will have Life. Worship team, please.